Welcome to our session on searching the GA universe, finding stars and black holes. And the goal of this session is to kind of walk through the steps of uh, finding a GA position and ultimately landing one, and then sharing some things that, uh, from my experience as an employer, help you become a shining star and some of those things to avoid so that you don't fall into the black hole of a candidate. Um, and we've got two experts uh, joining me who have recently gone through this experience and they will be sharing a lot of their personal um, stories as far as things that they encountered along the way based on the parts that we're gonna be talking about um, and sharing their advice and, and wisdom uh, from going through this process not that long ago. Um, so I'm gonna jump in and finish the introduction of who I am and then I'm gonna turn it over to Katie and Andrew to introduce themselves before we get going. My name is Alan Nordek. I'm the Director of Residence in Greek Life at the University of Central Missouri. In that role, I'm responsible for all of the staffing of our residence life and housing program, uh, which includes uh, 10 to 15 graduate assistants, as well as all the undergraduate staff and the full-time staff. I also work um, with our College Student Personnel Administration program in terms of helping our graduate students in that program find assistantships. So not only do I uh, have responsibility for the 10 to 15 graduate assistants, in housing, but typically work with student activities, the student union, and other campus offices who are looking to fill their graduate assistantship positions with students in our CSPA program. I'm going to have Katie and Andrew introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. All right, I'll go first. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie DeBridney. I'm a second year graduate student at the University of Central Missouri in the CSPA program. I'm currently serving my graduate assistantship as a residence hall director. I oversee two buildings. Um, and I'm also one of the moderators for the EPSA sessions, although not this one. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I am coming to UCM from Northern Arizona University, where I worked in housing for three years. Andrew, over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, so very similar response and position titles to Katie, but uh, my name is Andrew Course. I am also a second year college student personnel administration, uh, master's student at the University of Central Missouri. Um, I work as a residence hall director, um, also much like Katie, overseeing two buildings this year. Um, and I previously came from Pacific Lutheran University um, out in Tacoma, Washington, um, where I studied theater and music um, and worked in housing and residence life for three years as well. That led me here. Great. So in, in keeping with our Exploring the Universe theme, we're going to break this down into steps that are involved in our um, exploration. So, um, and Katie is our driver this morning and Andrew will be monitoring the chat room. So please add your questions uh, in the chat room um, and we will have time at the end to get to those as well as if we run out of time, we will have them so that uh, we can respond to them. But Andrew's gonna keep an eye on that for us as well. So obviously the first step is determining your mission. Um, you can't go on an exploration without knowing where you're wanting to go. Um, this mission really is about self-exploration and, and a lot of questions you need to ask for yourself. Um, are you looking at um, wanting to start your experience in student affairs, higher education in a full-time role? Or are you looking at pursuing your education and getting a master's degree first? So what are the steps that make sense for you personally in terms of how you want to begin this mission? If you want to pursue your master's degree, what area do you want to pursue your degree in? Is that a college student personnel administration degree? Is that a counseling degree? There are a lot of options in terms of how you enter the field of student affairs and higher education regarding your master's degree. So you have to ask yourself, what are you looking for in terms of the degree program that you are going to pursue your master's in? Where and what type of institution would you want to obtain this master's degree in? Is it a public or private institution? Is it a large or small institution? Is there geographic areas of the country that you want to pursue or you need to, to stay located in? So a lot of research regarding the type uh, and location of the institution are part of the self-exploration process. Um, where do you want to go? And I was talking about this briefly, but do you have geographic limitations? 
Do you need to be in a community that is a large urban community for transportation issues? Distance to family, is that a factor to you in terms of where you pursue your master's degree? So a lot of self personal circumstances that will drive the decision that you make. The next area is, do you want to get in, have an assistantship while pursuing your master's degree? Obviously, there's a lot of benefits of having an assistantship while pursuing your master's degree in terms of financial assistance for the cost of your education, possibly some housing assistance, and usually some kind of small salary while you're pursuing your education. But if you want an assistantship, what area do you want to work in? What types of experiences do you want to get out of that assistantship? What particular responsibilities are you looking for in that assistantship? And what do you want that assistantship to do to position you for that next step after obtaining your master's degree? So these are just some of the key questions, but this is the most important step in beginning this exploration is your self exploration. You have to understand these answers for yourself because in the end, this search is all about you. And I'm gonna turn it over to the experts to share a little bit about how they answered some of these questions. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, let's see here. When I was first diving into the graduate school search, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted. Um, I was just generally interested in all of it. And I found myself looking at programs that were like counseling, policy based, administration based, like student affairs based. I was really looking at all of it. And it wasn't until my supervisor sat me down and said, Katie, you're looking at two polar opposite programs. What are you actually going for? Um, and it wasn't until I started talking with other um, hall directors that they're like, you need to figure out what you want. Um, where are you willing to go? What are you actually interested in? Um, and so for me, the right fit was finding a generalist program like CSPA, um, because I'm generally interested in all of it. Um, I'm not specifically interested in counseling. Um, for me, I knew what job I wanted. Um, I wanted to be a hall director and I wanted to be able to find a degree that would help me get there. And so for me, the graduate assistantship was the big draw for me. All right, I'm gonna chime in on this one too. Um, this is good, certainly the slide that we'll talk about today, I think that resonates the most with me um, is this is where I had the most internal discussion with myself and internal development throughout my process. Um, so I started actually out of undergrad with a ton of passion. I knew that I wanted to work in housing and residence life. And I went gung-ho towards a full-time search immediately. I had so much passion and so much energy and um, spent most of my time applying for full-time roles within different universities and college campuses. Um, but I think the more I went through that process, the more I came to and continued to develop and, and came to the understanding that I really wanted to be pursuing a master's degree as well as getting that experience um, or that full-time feeling of experience so I could be... Um, feeling satisfied doing the work that I knew that I felt passionate about um, while still investing myself long-term. Um, something I found while going on my journey um, and applying to different full-time jobs originally uh, was so many institutions, while they would take people who had bachelor's degree, also really wanted you to have that development and that experience with that master's degree um, as a candidate, right? Um, so I settled on a master's degree program here at UCM specifically that allowed me to really feel as if I was getting both um, development towards my long-term goal of working in housing and residence life um, as a full-time professional. Um, so I could get the assistantship, right? And uh, it gave me that satisfaction of doing the work, right? But I could also um, be developing myself um, and continuing to learn in a more formal setting um, skills and things that I would not have necessarily gotten in undergrad. Um, and then the other thing I want to speak to, we talked a little about like institutional fit. Um, sometimes it's okay to have an institution that isn't exactly like the one you came from, right? Um, so I came from a small private liberal arts college um, and UCM is a public uh, mid-sized institution, um, very different geographic locations as well. Um, so I personally really enjoyed the diversity of the different institutions um, that I've been able to be at now, as now that I'm leaving, um, I have more um, of a lens on uh, what type of institution I'm looking for when I do apply for full-time positions. Thank you, Andrew and Katie. As you can see, they have experienced these exact questions and have reached the conclusion that they felt best for their personal circumstances at this present time. And they are asking these questions somewhat again, except for now they know they have a master's degree. Um, 
but the same kinds of things will continue every step of your journey as far as where do you want to go? What are the factors in terms of what you're looking for? So these self-exploration questions never go away in terms of your career. So we'll move on to our next step. So obviously this is a big galaxy. There are a lot of possibilities and opportunities out there. So we need to do our research on where we're trying to go within the galaxy. So the first, uh, and most of our research can be done via the internet now, which is great compared to when I was going through this process, you had to request catalogs and read all the catalogs and et cetera, et cetera. So this is much greater and easier to accomplish this wide search now. First and most important is the big picture. So again, we talked about that institutional fit and Andrew gave examples of that. So what are the institutions out there that fit the type of institution you're looking at for? And then do they have the graduate program that you are interested in? What is the processes of applying to the graduate school and the graduate program? And what are the dates and requirements of getting into the graduate program and the graduate school? So those I lump into the big picture things because if you do not um, know which graduate program and you don't understand the process for getting accepted to the graduate program and the timeline for the graduate program, you cannot get a graduate assistantship because you have to be in, a, in the graduate school and in a graduate program in order to have a graduate assistantship. So that's why I lump those into the big picture category. Um, and there's, well, in, in a minute, I'm gonna ask Katie and Andrew to talk about how they kept track of all this information because there is so much information to research in both of these areas. So after you've done your big picture search and, and research, it's then the assistantship. So those of you who answered, yes, I'm gonna want an assistantship while I go through this process, it's researching at those institutions that have the program that you're applying for, do they offer assistantships? If they do, can you find the job description? So you can read that job description to see if it offers you the experiences and the activities that you would do that fit what you're wanting to get out of the experience. What is the hiring process and the timeline that they are gonna use for selecting you for that assistantship? Obviously, you wanna know the compensation for a graduate assistantship. You need to know start dates based around your personal circumstances and a lot of other information that you might want to know particularly about the graduate assistantship. So that might be testimonials from current students in, in the graduate assistantships and those kinds of things. So start with the big picture, then move to the, the specifics of the job, the graduate assistantship, and using the internet to find those things. As I said, there's a lot of variants. There's a lot of information to keep track of in this research step. So I'm gonna again, turn it over to the two experts to talk to you about how they did this research, how they kept track of all the differences that they, could, that they were finding. Because one of the things in this area is we all have a different name for our graduate programs. We all have different requirements for our graduate programs. There are different dates, there's different deadlines, there's different requirements as far as GRE and all those kinds of things. So, so there's a lot to keep track of in this research process. And I'm going to ask Katie and Andrew to share how they went through this research and especially how they kept track of so much information. All right. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm going to start us off first on this one. Um, so for me, I am a major fan of spreadsheets. I live and die by spreadsheets. It's how I keep data all in orders. Um, so when I started this process early on for both, you know, when I was originally thinking about that full time search, um, but then even when I transitioned it over to looking at graduate programs, um, I used a spreadsheet, right? So institutional name, what positions they were offering, um, you know, what the program was called, if there was an application due date, um, and then any sort of notes that I had, um, a special requirements the program may have. Um, but then also ultimately what I found out as well, as I was going through these processes of applying, talking with people over the phone, um, I found that I also could use that spreadsheet to um, you know, document um, feelings and preferences I had toward those institutions as well. Um, so the spreadsheet I had became much, much larger and much more helpful when I came down to ultimately making decisions. Um, and then another tip I have would be, um, don't be afraid to reach out to the people of those institutions. Don't be afraid to call, don't be afraid to email those who are like program coordinators for graduate programs 
or um, those who are hiring for graduate assistantships. Um, I actually called Alan uh, before I even bothered to apply. I had some questions and things that I wanted to know um, and being able to listen and hear Alan um, answer some of those questions um, convinced me on um, applying to a position at UCM. So don't be afraid to reach out to those people who are in charge. Yeah, I did something very similar to Andrew in terms of keeping a spreadsheet. Um, I did, a, I had a few different methods of looking for schools. I did what's called an independent search as well as a placement exchange. And Alan's going to talk a little bit more about those later. Um, but I had, I made this robust spreadsheet that had deadlines, contacts, program requirements, application requirements, the whole shebang. Um, and some of the folks in this room have seen it. I color coded it based on schools that I was thinking of. I was kind of on the fence about ones that I would apply to ones that I decided not to apply to. Um, and I was checking back on that spreadsheet and adding to it as I needed to. Um, one thing that I did not have on that spreadsheet that Andrew mentioned that I should have was the, like the gut feeling um, column wherein you talk about, you write down what your gut feeling was about that institution. Um, Let's see here, other tips and tricks. Really, I relied on that spreadsheet. I did the bulk of my search over the summer since I was working in the housing office that summer. Um, and I was just combing through all the programs, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, because that's where I wanted to go. Um, and then just writing everything down. Um, and then reaching out to other hall directors on campus and just kind of figuring out what the application would take. Thank you, Katie and Andrew. And as you, they referenced, there's a lot to keep track of. Um, and it's really important that you understand that going into this search. Um, unfortunately, in higher education, like I say, there's different names for some things that are very similar. Some things can be very different. Um, there is a session later on in the conference about how to figure out which type of graduate program to look at, counseling, generalist, administrative, et cetera, et cetera, because that is a, a big part, as you heard Katie talk about a generalist search and those kinds of things. So there is a lot. That's why the spreadsheet is very helpful because of the fact that we don't all use the same lingo for the same thing. Uh, and that can get very confusing to you as a candidate. So our next step is you're going to get ready to launch this search. Um, so there are a lot of things to do before you begin actually uh, applying for the positions. So first, you obviously need to get your resume ready. Um, please have people help you review your resume, but understand in the end, it is your resume. For every person you ask to review your resume, I promise you, you will get a different opinion about something. And in the end, you have to like your resume the way you leave it. Um, but please know that when we each review it, we're going to give you our thoughts, and then you have to put those together to what you're comfortable with. The length of your resume, um, as, as someone coming out from undergraduate, um, looking for a graduate assistantship, a two-page resume should cover your experience well enough. Um, uh, as an employer, when I see a three or four-page resume as an undergrad, I'm like, you're a little bit too full of yourself. Um, so remind the length. When we look at resumes the very first time, and I don't know if any of you have ever talked to people in career services, and Chelsea, uh, who's moderating this program, um, could probably tell you from her experience in working in that area, we do not spend very long on the first pass of your resume. So it needs to be concise. It needs to be well-organized. Uh, consider the fonts that you're going to use. Consider um, if you're going to use bullet points or concise information so I can quickly, that first pass, see and understand the experiences that you are offering me as an employer. Please make sure your education is prominent um, because to get a graduate assistantship, you have to apply to graduate and be accepted to graduate school. So we need to know that you've completed an undergraduate degree um, and don't make me look hard to find your education experience. So I'm a firm believer that education should be one of the first things listed on a resume because most positions that you're going to apply for require some level of education. So let me see very quickly and easily that you meet that requirement. And then you wanna use your resume to highlight your experiences 
for the positions that you are applying. You are gonna to have to most likely submit a cover letter as the part of this process. So cover letters, it's easy to create a template that you can use and modify instead of having to write each and ind one individually, but be careful with your template. Um, you, your cover letter needs to make sure that it is matching the job that you are applying for at the institution in which you are expressing that interest. Let me know very quickly how you heard about the job and why you are interested in the job. Then the most important part of the cover letter is what I call the middle part. The experiences that and examples that match the job description. The cover letter is not a repeat of your resume. It is to say, yeah, my, I have had experiences in assisting students through crises. And from those experiences, this is how I operate. Um, so you're using the experiences that are listed on the resume and you're telling me examples of those experiences in the cover letter that are directly related to what you read in the, my job description. Um, again, a cover letter should be fairly brief, should not be a two page cover letter, ideally one page, but if it goes over a little bit because you need room for your signature and those kinds of things, uh, that's okay. Uh, but not two full pages of all context and your signature squeezed in at the bottom of that second page. Um, and then make sure that you feel like you have been thorough and very accurate. Um, the key ingredient here is again, that accuracy, as far as if you're using a template to make sure you've covered all the places that you have made adjustments for which institution, which job, those kinds of things. The third part of getting ready for the pre-application is your references you will be asked to have references. Your references will be contacted at some point. Um, you may need to list these references on the graduate school application. You may need to list these references on a formal HR application. You may need to be, list these references um, as part of your resume, that kind of stuff. You, sh you should start this process by asking the people to serve as your reference. Just because they're your immediate supervisor, you should not assume they will serve as a reference. It is it is correct to ask them to serve. You should plan on having a minimum of three and the most I've ever seen any job asked for is up to five, uh, but you, I've not seen one ask for less than three. Um, so three to five is the number. You need to make sure you have all the correct contact information for your reference so that you can list it correctly in all the different places in which you are gonna be asked to provide it. You need to make sure that you're keeping those people that are agreeing to serve as your reference well informed of your process and where things are so that they know, oh, somebody might be reaching out to me for Katie because that she's told me she's at that point in the process. Um, or to make sure your references know where you have applied in case there's an informal network at work um, and you as a candidate might not know that. So that information flow to your references is very important. Please have a very candid conversation with your references. What will you say are my strengths and weaknesses? I have yet to conduct a job search or be in a job search as a candidate or strengths and weaknesses in whatever form were not asked. And as a reference, I have never not been asked that about a candidate in which I've served as a reference. So you should know what your references will say about your strengths and weaknesses. Um, and it's very appropriate for you to ask your references to answer that question to you um, so that you are aware of what they will say. Because in this process, as an employer, I'm going to ask you, the candidate, your strengths and weaknesses. I'm going to ask your references your strengths and weaknesses. And if they don't seem to line up, red flags go up. So that's why you should know what they're going to say about uh, your strengths and weaknesses. So again, uh, I think there's another part of this one, Katie, before we get into, oops. So there are different places in which you're going to search. Um, there are ex placement exchanges that exist, which are great and convenient because they're kind of a one-stop, see multiple options in a, in a convenient fashion. Um, Oshkosh Placement Exchange that takes place in late February 
uh, hosted at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh is one of those that tends to offer a lot of positions for graduate assistantship as well as uh, entry level positions. The placement exchange is a joint effort between NASPA and a QOI, tends to be more focused on uh, full time positions, but from the entry level up through the more advanced level positions. Um, ACPA also does a placement exchange as part of their um, experiences. So there are opportunities to participate in a structured system through these kinds of placement exchanges. But there are also, you may just do an independent search. And I think both Katie and Andrew talked about um, that aspect. In an independent search, know the sources in which you're going to go look for openings and opportunities. Be be diligent about the timing in which you're going to look. Don't wait till too late because, again, as we talked about in the process, there may be dates that in a graduate school and graduate program processes that if you miss those dates, you can't advance into the job search. So watching for the timing. And there's all kinds of places about how to conduct an independent search. So this is where I'm going to ask Katie and Andrew again to share a little bit about how they maneuvered this part of the search process. I'll hop in on placement exchanges first. Um, so I mentioned previously that I did both independent and the Oshkosh placement exchange. And so I can't, I can't speak to both. Although I came to UCM through the Oshkosh placement exchange, which was this huge experience. Um, I went out to ice cold Oshkosh, Wisconsin, um, interviewed with 13 different schools. It's kind of like speed dating with college universities as you're doing rapid fire interviews with them. Um, but it's also a real quick and easy way to get connected with all these institutions. Um, I did learn um, that for this upcoming year for OPE, they're doing, um, they're not having a virtual component or an in-person component due to COVID, um, but they will still have listings available. And so they will still have OPE available to an extent, but it will not be the full experience this year. Um, as far as independent search goes, uh, do, 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 do. Sources timing and how I had to move some windows over. Um, like I said, over the summer, I combed through all these different institutions. I interviewed with several. Um, I had my top picks for universities before I went to OPE. Um, but the, the thing with applying for both a GA ship and a master's program is that at many institutions, they are separate processes and you can get one and not get the other. Um, and so for me, my independent search, search ended when the schools that I applied to let me into their program, but I did not get the GA ship. Um, whereas at OPE, they are still separate processes, but they tend to be a little more linked together. Wonderful, I'm gonna chime in real quick. Um, so I also did an independent search along with the placement exchange. Um, I went to the placement exchange um, back in 2019. Um, and I absolutely agree with what Alan said. Um, this tends to be more for people who are starting out looking for full-time roles or entry-level full-time positions. Um, still a wonderful experience. And I did get to meet a lot of people who um, are in the field today in different institutions and got to shake a lot of hands and meet a lot of people. Um, but if there is some advice I would give you that hasn't been said yet for where to find positions as well, don't be afraid to look online. Um, there are many different online places, um, whether it be higheredjobs.com or for me, I found UCM through social media, right? So there's many different future student affairs groups on Facebook, residence life professionals groups, or, um, you know, there are many different Facebook groups. Um, and those groups are all the time posting about um, new applications or GA positions or um, graduate school deadlines. Um, so don't be afraid to use social media as well to scout out a really cool position that's gonna be perfect for you. Great, thank you. That was an excellent point about another source, and that source is growing all the time. How to decide which is better, it's a personal decision, um, and as you heard both from Andrew and Katie. So we're going to move on to the next step, and we're going to pick up the pace because I understand our time's wrapping up very quickly. Um, so now the liftoff. You're actually applying. You are a candidate because you've done all those things. So you've submitted the application, make sure that you're very thorough in the materials requested for the application, that you're timely and meaning that you've met those deadlines, that you've completed everything that's required of the application, um, and that you submitted that application via the instructions they gave you. So some may have online systems to submit, some may 
allow you to submit via email as attachments. So just follow the instructions about how you are to submit those materials. Um, pay close attention to who you're supposed to communicate with in this process and how you're expected to communicate. Is that via email? Is that phone call? Is there an online chat system or whatever they're using in terms of the, how the communication flow will go? And pay attention to the when you should expect communication. So that again goes back to the timeline and those kinds of things that are back in the process is if you know that the application's closed on a certain date, then you can begin the wind communication after that process has closed. So hopefully you will move to the interview process. So in the interview process, it's important to know how they're gonna conduct the interview. And in the COVID world, that has changed significantly. Um, you should expect mostly virtual um, interviews through this process. Uh, I expect that to remain in place for at least the next year. Um, so how will the interview happen? Who will you be talking to in the interview process? When will the interview be taking place? And in particular on the when is, remember, you may have applied to institutions that are not in the same time zone that you currently are in. So keep track of the time zone in which those are um, because it's very disheartening when we reach out to a candidate in a different time zone and they forgot to recognize that I'm in a different time zone. So they weren't there when I reached out because we miscommunicated on the time zone. Make sure you are well prepared for your interview. And that is think about the questions that you know they may ask and how you will answer them. Um, make sure you've talked about the setting in which you're gonna do that interview. What's your background uh, of your uh, Zoom or Skype going to look like that you yourself are prepared um, for sitting down and focusing on the questions. Think about the attire, even though these will probably be mostly virtual interviews, the attire speaks about your seriousness in that process. I, the funny story is we did a Skype interview with a candidate that we could clearly did not think about their attire. Um, and obviously that was somebody that we were not as interested in afterwards. Um, and then the last step is after the interview, your follow-up. Be timely again, so don't reach out immediately, but again, knowing that timeline that they're going to uh, use, make sure you're timely in your follow-up, that you're appropriate in your follow-up, that you are professional in your follow-up, and that you are ethical in your follow-up. And ethical means that you're not saying, well, that just, I had a horrible experience, so I'm no longer interested. Um, so, those are some key steps in the liftoff. And we're gonna quickly move into the next step of the landing, which is concluding the job search. You're going to get offers and some, op you can only accept one offer. You may get multiple offers. So both in accepting and declining the job offer, most importantly is to be honest. And there will be positions that you will, that just won't feel like they're right for you. The fit, that gut feeling that Katie and Andrew talked about won't be as strong for some positions. And it's be honest to yourself, be honest to the employer, be timely in accepting or declining. So they are probably gonna say the time frame in which we need an answer, please honor that time frame. Um, they're going to um, be thankful for the experience that you had because you took time, they took time for you to get to the point of offering or you know, where you're accepting or declining, and then make sure that you are closing out the process. So to formally decline, if that means that you have to also submit something in writing, do that or whatever the process may need in order to close it out. Um, and the key ingredient here is the timely, honest part. Um, so, those are some things that I would tell you in terms of concluding the search. We're quickly running out of time, so we're gonna move very fast. These are things from my experience that make you a right, a shining star in this process. And we've talked a little bit about these, the organization that you present, your timeliness, your thoroughness, how well prepared you are, that ethical. And what I mean in ethical is, as um, our keynotes talked about, this field, people know a lot of people. 
And so when I find out from a colleague that you said not so nice things about us, that sways my decision. So again, being ethical that, you know, honesty versus um, being mean, rude, whatever words, uh, again, kind of ties in the next one, that you are kind. The key ingredient in this is that I can tell that you know who you are and what you are looking for. That makes a big difference in terms of where you stand with us as a candidate, especially as a graduate assistant, because you are young beginning this journey. And when I know that you are as self-aware, that speaks volumes about you as a candidate. Be positive in all approaches and about yourself. And most importantly, be yourself. Um, so don't misrepresent who you are and how you say things and what you say, be yourself in that process. So what would make you fall into the black hole, the not so positive things of a candidate, which is our next slide, the underprepared. It really becomes quite obvious as an employer when a candidate has not done their research, has not thought about their answers to typical questions that we're gonna ask, becomes quite evident and clearly does not advance you to the, to the star level in the search process. If there's lack of attention to detail, this is where I talk about be careful with a template of your cover letter. I receive at least one cover letter every single year where they forget to change the institution name in the cover letter. Does not move them to the star level. Um, so that attention to detail is important. The follow-up, both if you if I reach out to you and you just don't respond, that doesn't reach, that falls into the black hole. So please follow up with communication, even if it's to say thank you, but no thanks. I'm pursuing other options. Um, and B, there are candidates who have been inappropriate in their attire. They have been inappropriate in the language that they use um, in the interview. And some of their self behaviors have not always demonstrated the type of uh, person that we're looking for to go into the field. Be very, very careful about gossip. Um, as again, we've already talked about people, it's a high, strong network profession. And so what you say to somebody else may come back. So be very careful about gossip regarding institutions, regarding the people that you talk to in the interview process, that kind of stuff. Because if it comes back around, that does not advance your candidacy, it falls, it can lead to the black hole. So that was very, very, very quick. I'm gonna, we're gonna end the session. And unfortunately, I think we're gonna be out of time to take questions, uh, but we will respond to those uh, uh, in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna let Katie and Andrew give you that, what they would say as the great opportunities that exist. And we thank you for participating and those that are gonna be watching this session later, we thank you for your interest. You will see the last slide has all of our contact information. Do not hesitate to email us with further questions or anything that we can do to assist you in this process. You have our email contact there. So we're gonna end real quick with Katie and Andrew, parting words. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start us off then. Um, I would just say, um, believe in yourself um, more than you, you think. Um, it's a crazy long process, but it's also a crazy exciting process. Um, so believe in yourself, have faith, um, show a little passion um, and be excited. It's such an exciting time of your life. Yeah, and um, in addition to believing in yourself, um, trust your gut. Um, if going through the process and you will hear a lot, oh, trust the process, it can be very stressful and you're thinking like, I'm not getting any offers and you feel inclined to accept the first offer you receive. But if your gut reaction upon interviewing with that school was not a good, if you didn't have a good experience, then trust your gut and don't accept that offer. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you everyone.